talk about some of the causes of World War II, and I actually gave you how many? Four, but in, in reality, there's five. We just kind of put the last two uh, together, appeasement and isolationism. And I just gave you one of the causes. Somebody give me another one. The Treaty of Versailles. Why do we say the Treaty of Versailles is a cause of World War II? Didn't it end a war? Yeah, it pushed the pause button, right? And then Hitler invades Poland and pushes play, and it all starts over again. Uh, what else? One that, that I can't... I'm sorry, what? Nationalism, that's another one. Good. What else? Economic factors, and by those we primarily mean what, Liam? So, and I said yesterday, the Great Depression ends with the start of, but at the same time, it is a cause of World War II. And I find that kind of interesting that, you know, this great period of, of economic downturn ends with a war, and it's also a cause of the war. Um, good. And then I think we were looking at, at this cartoon when we left yesterday. The three-headed monster represents who? What countries? Italy, Japan, and Germany. And then the little baby represents the Allies. In particular, who? In particular, who in 1942? Oh, United States. And, and the, the, um, the line there is perfect. Just wait until the little feller grows up. And we're going to see how that little feller grew up and uh, understand why uh, the United States and, and the Allies were able to defeat Hitler, Germany, and Japan. All right. Good. Any other questions? Comments? Concerns? Nothing's bothering you today? Everything's good? You're on video, so now's your opportunity. Yes. Tanks and ships, and Japan having the um, airships, and then Italy has a, a, a old gun. Yeah. They weren't the soft underbelly of Europe. Yeah, and, and what does the United States have? A giant slingshot. A slingshot yeah. and a rock. And literally, that's about what America had. Their army was incredibly small. Um, if it hadn't been for Carl Vinson, the Navy would have been destroyed at Pearl Harbor. I mean, totally destroyed. Uh, but he had the foresight to create, to help create that two ocean Navy. Um, my, um, Miss Karen's uncle, great uncle, well, not her great uncle, actually her uncle, and his wife and their grandson are in Hawaii, are in, um, San Diego right now. Uncle John was a 42-year Navy veteran. He lied at the age of 17 to join the Navy, he and his twin brother, and became um, the force master chief or a force master chief. There's only four of those in the Navy at any one time. But he sent me a picture yesterday, the USS Carl Vinson, CVN 70, and the USS Abraham Lincoln were both in port in San Diego, and they're docked right next to each other. It's a cool picture. Um, I can tell y'all are interested in that. So. Anywho, um, what else? Anything about our picture? David and Goliath, of course, and David slew the giant. So this is to revert back to my English teaching days. This is what? Well, it's not. Well, it kind of is propaganda, but it's an illusion. There you go. Not an illusion, but an allusion. Good. All right, so let's move on. And we'll finish this today, by the way, and move on to something else tomorrow. Wow. All right. Um, so tensions are, are increasing. Um, some things that are happening before 1941, before America enters the war. We're talking 1937, 1938, 1939. 
Japan under Emperor Hirohito. But there's also who? The Prime Minister, what's his name? Hideki Tojo. Tojam. Hideki Tojam. Ooh. Um, Japan actually attacks the country of China. Now, how big is Japan? About that big? About that big? It's an island. How big is China? It's one of the largest countries in the world, if not the largest country landmass in the world. How many people live in China? A lot. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that live in China. But yet Japan attacks China because China is still using, in some cases, 17th and 18th century weaponry. And Japan has modern 20th century airplanes, tanks, guns. And it is essentially a slaughter. And the Japanese are very ruthless. Um, in fact, if you probably, if you look at that World War II book, A Photographic History, you'll be able to see pictures from what is called the Rape of Nanking. Um, and I think I mentioned that yesterday. Uh, but it was a horrific act by the Japanese. I mean, they killed men, women, children, dogs, cats, you know, whatever. Um, they would um, take women prisoner and use them as sex slaves. So, I mean, they're, they're not very nice people. If you read about the war in the Pacific, um, you know, they did not treat prisoners well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's amazing what human beings will do to each other, and and we really see that in World War II, not only during the war between combatants, but you know, just people, civilians. Um, Italy, Mussolini, you know, he takes the easy way out. He attacks Ethiopia. I mean, really? Ethiopia? What'd they ever do? What does he want? He wants natural resources. What does Japan want? And what does Japan need? Natural resources. They don't have any. They're an island, and when I, you know, they, it's just difficult to get natural resources. Um, Albania, a Central European country, is attacked by Italy. Um, it's near the boot of Italy or near Italy. Um, Germany, of course, Adolf Hitler um, becomes the leader of Germany itself. He is elected chancellor, I think, is the term they use. Um, and he calls himself the what? Fuhrer. The Führer. He was the then he became chancellor. Then he the chancellor. Yeah, he yeah. Well, he was an old guy. Who was that? That was uh, Hindenburg. Is that who it was? No. No. Is the name of the I know, but no, no, no. it wasn't. It That's who I was thinking about, actually, was Bismarck. Anyway, um, you know, he becomes the Nazi leader. Under the Treaty of Versailles, countries are limited in um, what kind of military they can have, what kind of navy they can have. And Germany, under Hitler, ignores that and begins to build up their military. Um, does the rest of the world take notice of that? They do, but you're absolutely right. They do nothing until it is absolutely too late. Um, the mid-1930s, 36, 37, um, Hitler begins to persecute the Jews um, under a series of laws called the Nuremberg Laws. Now, if you need something to compare that to, think Jim Crow laws, except directed at Jews in Germany. 
and then later <laughs> Poland and other places. Um, and again, he begins to silence people who are opposed to him. One of my favorite writers is a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer was a preacher in Germany in the 1930s. He left Germany and moved to America to escape what was going on in Germany. <clears throat> he realized that if he were going to be helpful in rebuilding Germany after the war, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually, then he had to go and live in Germany and go through what the people of Germany were going to go through. So he moves back to Germany. He's actually in, um, oh, what's the name of that town? doesn't matter. But he begins what becomes known as the underground church in Germany. And they are the church that speaks out against Hitler. The rest of German churches do not. But um, the underground church does. As a result, Bonhoeffer is put on the list. He's arrested. He's sent to Auschwitz. Continues to write from prison. Uh, in fact, I don't know if it's here at home, but a great book called Letters and Papers from Prison, written by Bonhoeffer. It's what he recorded while he was in concentration camp. Um, he dies about three days before Auschwitz is liberated. So he almost survives the war, um, but was, again, very instrumental in, in helping the church be a presence in um, the post, well, not only during the war, but, but the post-war years as well. And then you got good old Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. He was a nice guy. No, he wasn't. If if he liked you, he was a really nice guy. But if he didn't like you, he was just going to have you killed. Um, I think it was, what, 20 million? Is that right? Roughly? But it's probably more than that um, of his own people that he killed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to look. I'm going to show you a video probably next week, maybe Monday, um, or it might even be as soon as Friday, about um, deaths in World War II and how it compares to other wars. And the difference is absolutely staggering. We're talking millions and millions of people who died. So, what happens? Well, once again, the United or uh, the world is divided. September first, nineteen thirty nine, Nazi Germany attacks Poland, and by the way, Poland is using horses against tanks. Not a good match, is it? No. no. And it doesn't end well for Poland. Um, it's a very short um, period before Poland is... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, two or three days and it's over with. Um, but we have the world divided into two hostile um, armed camps. Uh, we have the Axis powers, and you can see them here. Um Germany, of course, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. Japan, um, under leadership of Emperor Hirohito. And also, who? Hideki Tojo. And then Italy, under Benito Mussolini. And shortly after this, you can throw the Soviet Union in on the side of the axis. Not long after. The Allies, um, eventually, it's Great Britain, um, France, the Soviet Union. Well, there's free France. Yeah. Um, and the, the French underground really is instrumental in helping to take France back. And then um, eventually, well, not even eventually. Um, yeah, eventually you have the United States. Sorry. Um, these three guys, anybody know who they are? Churchill. It'd be better if you had a cigar. And this picture says, you know, they say a picture's worth what? 
This picture is worth a thousand words if you stop and take a minute and examine it. Great Britain had been the world's greatest empire. I mean, they really had. Um, and even as we enter World War II, they are their colonial power. They own much of Africa. The Soviet Union and the United States, compared to Great Britain, are very young nations. Um, how does Churchill look in this picture? Look like his dog just died? Yeah. Yeah. And you know why? Well, maybe, but he, he looks defeated or deflated because he has come to the realization of something at this particular conference. He realizes when all this is over, Great Britain will be a second rate country. And it's kind of the changing of the guard. There will be two superpowers left standing at the end of World War II, and they're these two guys. Compare their posture. I mean, and this guy can't walk, but look how he sits. His head up, chest out. Look at me. Yeah. And Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin's the same way. And these two actually became fairly close, but it doesn't last. Um, and probably the reason it doesn't last is Roosevelt dies. Had a lot to do with it. Think things after World War II. Or who knows? Roosevelt might have told George Patton, go kill the commies. Who knows? That was discussed. That was talked about. Yeah. I mean, you talk about nationalism. Yeah. Better red than dead. No, better dead than red. Right. Better dead than red. Anywho. So, whoop. Let's go back this way. The Axis powers, Germany, Italy, um, Japan, quickly gain the upper hand. Here's a map. Um, and this would be probably 1940. Um, but you can see f half of France, most of France has been captured. Switzerland is neutral for whatever reason. Yeah, they don't fight anybody. Um, you can see Italy has taken Africa. Um, well, part of Africa, France controls part of Africa as well, the desert. And you can see that, um, Germany makes pretty good progress into um, the Soviet Union. So most of Europe is controlled. You've got a few isolated spots that are not controlled by the Axis powers. I didn't put a map of the Euro of uh, the Pacific up here. We'll, we'll get to that a little later. But Japan controls most of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Um, and where's the United States during all this? I'm going to let y'all fight, and I'm going to stand back over here and watch. I'm going to remain neutral. I'm going to be an I'm going to practice isolationism. I'm not going to be involved with it. And for two years, actually a little more than two years, the United States is not involved in World War II. Or are they? Hmm. So, 1938, going backwards a little bit, Hitler, um, Germany attacks France. They really don't attack deep into France. They just want the Rhineland back, which is land that had been given to France in the Treaty of Versailles. They're just claiming what is rightfully theirs in the eyes of Hitler and Germany. Um, they send troops to take over Austria. Austria really wants to be a part of Germany at this point in time. They are Germanic people. Um, Hitler himself is Austrian. He's not, he wasn't born in Germany. He was born in Austria. Yeah, and uh, his grandmother was Jewish, apparently. Who knows if that's rumor or fact. Um, Czechoslovakia, and then eventually they invade Poland. And Poland is when, they know when they invade Poland, that France and Great Britain are going to come to the aid of Poland. 
Um, and again, Poland is fighting the German army using horses. And again, it, it doesn't end well. Called the Blitzkrieg, a term that we'll hear from time to time. So Great Britain and France declare war because Germany invades Poland and their allies. The Soviet Union says, hey, we want part of this. And they invade Poland from the other direction and other countries. And essentially, the Soviet Union and Germany come together. They have an agreement. Um, the Soviet Union will split Poland with Germany. And the Soviet Union will fight um, with Germany. No, he would never double cross you. Yeah. Barbarossa? Oh, yeah. Because communism is a complete opposite of fascism. Fascism is a complete opposite, the opposite of communism. Yeah. Um, tactically, um, it was not a bad decision from, from Hitler to invade the Soviet Union. Logistically, it was a wreck. It was a nightmare. And I'll show you a map in just a second. You look at the sheer distance from Germany to the Soviet Union, from Germany to Moscow. Yeah, it's done. And the Soviet Union did not, speaking of atrocities, the Soviet Union did not treat German prisoners of war very, very well. In fact, I'm not sure there were ever any POWs in the Soviet Union. There were a lot of casualties. There were a lot of deaths. But I don't know that there were ever POWs taken by the Soviet Union because they did not like Germany. So... 1940 rolls around, Hitler controls Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and most of France. And they begin bombing Great Britain. Great Britain is the last stronghold of democracy in Europe at this time. And people will argue, well, what about France? What about France? France is controlled by Germany. Um, and so... Uh, Great Britain is the last democratic stronghold, and they begin to bomb Great Britain. How many of you have seen um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the movie? Some of you. Do you, do you remember the, one of the opening scenes? The Battle of London is depicted. The, the children who end up going into Narnia are actually living in London. Their parents send them away out into the country to get them away from the fighting. This is 1940. Um, Germany bombs Great Britain with no regard for civilian life. Do the Allies do that? Yeah. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's probably some pictures in that, but there's a lot of pictures of like British citizens in like subway cars. Uh -huh. American air power becomes superior and they begin to bomb Germany um, even before then when there's still a chance they'll all get shot down and die. Um, the Allies bomb Germany and they, I mean, it is, it's ruthless. And then Japan is even worse. Um, so both sides have little regard for civilian life. And that's part of the reason that when we look at that film about deaths in World War II, the number is so staggering because there were a lot of civilians that died. So, the United States is neutral, right? And I love this Dr. Seuss cartoon. You've got Uncle Sam lying in a bed all by himself, 
Is there anything wrong with him? He looks fat, happy, and content, doesn't he? Then look in the bed next to him. Stalinich, Hitleritis, Blitzpox, Nazi fever, fascist fever, and the Italian mumps. And he's like, ho-hum, no chance of contagion. What's he saying? It's not my problem. It's not going to bother me. It's not going to affect me. It's not going to infect me. Does it? Well, obviously it does. But this is this is the approach the U.S. takes. Um, mo- most Americans don't want to go to war. They're very much opposed to getting involved in a European war. But Roosevelt wants to help Britain because he understands something. If Britain falls, Europe falls. And there will not be a democratic government in Europe. And so he understands the need to help Great Britain. And it is a tremendous issue. I don't know why I put this in here, but it's a tremendous issue. And it is debated in the press. It's debated um, in Congress. Um, You know, should we, shouldn't we, should we, shouldn't we? And ultimately, of course, we do. But there's, you know, the idea of nationalism. That's not our problem. We're better than they are. That's not our problem. And then there's um, appeasement. You know, what's Great Britain doing? What did they try to do? They tried to appease uh, Germany. Did America try that? Not so much, but there was some of it. Um, Hitler turns on Stalin in 1941 and invades the Soviet Union. It's not the best map in the world, but the red would be Germany. And they do push into the United Soviet Socialist Republic. They get close um, to Moscow. But there are a couple of things. Look how far it is from Germany to Moscow. Where's Moscow? I think it's right here, right there. I mean, they get really close. What do you know about the weather in Russia? It gets really cold. It's so cold that the fuel, the fuel inside the tanks might just start freezing. Yeah, which gasoline diesel doesn't freeze. You might have to start heating your horses. But then it does. <laughs> yeah, but then it does. And so um, logistics is what defeats Germany with the Soviet Union. Not only that, but the Soviet Union was really pissed off. They were really angry. And so when I say that there are very few German POWs in the Soviet Union, it's because they killed them all. Because the Germans hadn't been too nice to the Russian people or Soviet people as they had come through. And so they get their revenge. Um, You know, the Soviet Union uh, is very cold. Uh, German troops, very long supply line. They don't have adequate fuel, they don't have adequate food, they don't have adequate clothing. Some of them are wearing summer uniforms. And uh, it it doesn't end well. And then what does the Soviet Union do? Pushes them all the way back to Berlin eventually. Yes? I was watching Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And they're fighting against Soviet tanks, right? They're fighting against Soviet tanks. Or are they? Some of them are Soviet tanks. Some of them are good old USA tanks. Because um, the United States starts a program called the Lend-Lease Program. Uh, we're going to lend or rent you, lease you, whatever you need. Okay? Those tanks that end up going to the Soviet Union. Um, when compared to German tanks, U.S. tanks were inferior. They, they had weaknesses. The German tank didn't have many weaknesses. We... 
we kind of overwhelmed them with the sheer number yeah. that we were able to, to throw at the Germans. And, and some of those went to the Soviet Union. We lent them tanks. I don't know about you, but I don't want a gently used tank coming back to me or one that, you know, comes back in pieces. I broke your tank. I'm sorry. So was it really, we're going to lend this to you or we're just going to give it to you? They just gave it. I mean, we just gave the Soviet Union and Great Britain billions of dollars of material. Um, we got some things in exchange for it. And I asked the question a minute ago, was the United States involved in the war before 1941? Yes. We just weren't, we didn't have boots on the ground. You know, we weren't in Europe and we weren't in the Pacific. Um, but one thing we did is we began to escort British ships across the North Atlantic um, to protect them from what? German U-boats, submarines, wolf packs, that's what they were called. Um, so 1941, this Lend-Lease Act is signed. Food, oil, equipment are going to Britain, somewhat France, but mostly Britain and the Soviet Union. Now, what drags the United States into the war? Well, one thing is the Lend-Lease Program itself, or the Lend-Lease Act. Um, the United States is neutral again. We, we know that, you know. Um, isolationism, we're not going to be involved. They kind of throw that out the window with the Lend-Lease Act, and they become involved. Um, because Roosevelt understands if Great Britain falls, if France is not um, recovered and restored, democracy is dead in Europe. And so it's, it's very important. 1941, again, Congress passes the Lend-Lease Act. Um, and, and the wording is supplies to any country um, whose defense is critical to the United States, to the security of the United States. What do we get? Well, England says, okay, you can build bases on Greenland and Iceland. And guess what? They're still there today. Um, it, it gave a place to stop on your way to, if you were flying to um, England. Ultimately, it ends up being about $50 billion, which if you do the math, that's about $700 billion today, if you remember from yesterday. So um, the U.S. does become involved in the war. Um, what it does, and I think we're finished, aren't we? Yeah, well, darn. Okay, we'll stop right there then. No, I know, I know, I know. Um, tomorrow we'll pick up with um, continuing the Lend-Lease Act. Um, talk about Roosevelt's term for the United States, an arsenal for democracy, which is a pretty cool thing.